A gracious good day to one and all once again. Tis I, Norton the First, by grace of God, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico. Back with you all, once again, for episode number 203 of Emperor Norton's Fantastic History Vlog. Today is March 31st, 2021. We'll be covering March 31st to April 6th today. And it is our 381st day living under COVID-19 restrictions. Rather hard to believe, isn't it? But things are looking better. A brief programming note. Uh, we are still have not heard anything about whether or not there shall be an earthquake and fire 1906 commemoration this year. Now, we are not advocating that anyone show up at Lada's Fountain like we did in years past. No, it is still not safe to do such. But if nothing is planned, we will send out next week, we suppose, uh, a link to a Zoom meeting that you can then attend to commemorate the earthquake and fire virtually. Uh, keep tuned to this channel or our Facebook, Twitter accounts, etc. for more information. We should do something, shouldn't we? Yes, we believe so. Well, let's begin with our national days, as we do. March 31st, National Clams on the Half Shell Day. And roller skates, roller skates. April 1st, our favorite holiday, St. Stupid's Day. A grand parade is usually held every year by the First Church of the Last Laugh, which we always attend, but not this year, no. You know, one of the unifying bonds in society is stupidity. Oh, by the way, it's also National Burrito Day. So if you can't uh, join the St. Stupid's Day Parade, grab a burrito, the taquerias are open. The second is National Ferret Day and National Walk to Work Day. So kill two birds with one stone, walk your ferret to work that day. That's the second. Third, National Tweed Day. Hats off to the steampunks, we love them. The fourth, National Ramen Day, and we do love a good bowl of ramen. Mm. April 5th, Read a Roadmap Day. We can still read a roadmap. Anybody remember roadmaps? Yes. That was that thing we had to fold up before we had a Google Maps. Yes, indeed. And April 6th is National Epitaph Day. Our epitaph simply reads, Emperor of the United States and Protector of Mexico, which of course we are. So in looking back over a year's worth of episodes, still hard to believe, we realized that we had never done an episode about ourselves. We mentioned a little bit about our story, but so we've established this new format now, second week. Uh, we thought we would dig a little bit deeper into our story today. And by the way, an excellent podcast was just posted uh, about our lives, and she does a great job. It's called Noble Blood. So check it out, a lot of the same information, but she does an excellent presentation. Hats off. We'll begin with some quotes. San Francisco is a mad city inhabited by the most part by perfectly insane people, but whose women are of a remarkable beauty, said Rudyard Kipling. It's an odd thing, but anyone who disappears is said to be seen in San Francisco. That was said by Oscar Wilde. Everybody understands Mickey Mouse, few understand Herman Hesse, hardly anyone understands Albert Einstein, and no one understands Emperor Norton. That was said by Malcolips the Younger, uh, who is part of the Discordia movement, and we are the patron saint of Discordia. San Francisco has been known throughout its history as a haven for colorful characters, but perhaps none more colorful and more remembered as me. I was born Joshua Abraham Norton on February 4th, 1818 in the Deptford area, which is now part of London. It is said when I was two years old, my family emigrated to Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, South Africa. After my father's death, I left South Africa in 1849 with $40,000. And like so many others that year, 
I sailed to San Francisco to seek my fortune, arriving on Commercial Street's long wharf aboard the Franzica. But I would not make my money by panning for gold. Instead, I founded Joshua Norton and Company in an Adobe Cottage at Jackson and Montgomery Streets, where the building known as Sherman's Bank stands today. I acquired and sold entire shiploads of commodities. I built a cigar factory, a small wood-framed office building, a rice mill, and purchased investment properties in just a few short years. I increased my nest egg to $250,000, which is the equivalent of $10 million in today's currency. I became one of San Francisco's most prominent citizens. Even then, they called me the emperor, for I was an empire builder. I hobnobbed with San Francisco society and business elite and was a charter member of Occidental Number 22 of the Freemasons and the Vigilance Committee. But my fortune was not enough. I wanted more money. A rice famine struck China in 1850, causing rice prices to triple in the U.S. Believing I was cornering the market on rice, I purchased what I believed the, to be the only boatload of the commodity in San Francisco Harbor at a premium. Thinking that I would increase my fortune many times fold when the rice peaked, the price of rice peaked rather, <clears throat> unknown to me were the two shiploads of Peruvian rice arriving over the next several days, each the size of what I had already had. The price of rice plummeted to less than what it was than before the famine, and my rice was nearly worthless. A legal battle ensued, leaving me bankrupt. By 1857, I was a shamed, broken, and mostly forgotten man. I disappeared for a couple of years. What happened to me during that time is largely unknown. Then, on the 17th of September, 1859, I walked into the offices of the San Francisco Bulletin newspaper and handed editor George Fitch the following proclamation requesting its publication. At the peremptory request and desire of a large majority of the citizens of these United States, I, Joshua Norton, formerly of Algoa Bay, Cape of Good Hope, and now for the last nine years and ten months past, of San Francisco, California, declare and proclaim myself emperor of these United States. And in virtue of the authority thereby in me vested, do hereby order and direct the representatives of the different states of the union to assemble in musical hall of this city on the first day of February next. Then and there to make such alterations to the existing laws of the union as may ameliorate the evils under which this country is laboring and thereby cause confidence to exist, both at home and abroad, in our stability and integrity. Norton I, Emperor of the United States. The next morning, a headline in the bulletin read, Have we an emperor among us? The, bullet the bulletin printed the proclamation, on the 17th of September, 1859, I would become Norton I, Emperor of the United States, and later I would add the title, Protector of Mexico. In any other city in the world, I would be declared a madman, but not in San Francisco. Indeed, the people of San Francisco treated me as if I really were their emperor. For the next 21 years, I ate for free in restaurants. The police would salute me. I rode transit for free. I even printed my own imperial treasury bonds, which were accepted as legal tender throughout the entire city whenever I presented them. As emperor, I had to be suitably clothed, and uniforms were given to me by army officers at the Presidio. I would be seen walking the streets of San Francisco in this Union officer's frock coat, enhanced with epaulets topped with a tall beaver hat, enhanced with epaulets on the shoulders, of course, plumes on the hat, and a cavalry sword on my hip, an umbrella, and a ornately handled walking stick. I was determined to make great changes and issued numerous proclamations, calling for Congress, the Supreme Court, the Presidency, as well as the Democratic and Republican parties to be dissolved. Not a bad idea, eh? Hmm. 
I also issued proclamations that although dismissed at the time were testaments to my imperial vision. I called for the spanning of San Francisco Bay by either a bridge or tunnel. The following is decreed in order to be carried into execution as soon as is convenient. That a suspension bridge be built from Oakland Point to Goat Island and thence to Telegraph Hill provided such bridge can be built without injury the navigable waters of the Bay of San Francisco. I called for the nations of the world to be brought together in one place to promote world peace, the erection of a Christmas tree in Union Square every December, and today we have the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, which by all rights should be named the Emperor Norton Bridge, the Bart Trans Bay Tube, we shall accept that as well, and the United Nations and the annual Union Square Christmas tree, all testaments to my imperial vision. I also issued a proclamation that unfortunately goes unenforced, and there is some controversy as to whether or not I ever did actually issue one, but let us just say, for the sake of argument, that we did. Whoever, after due and proper warning, shall be heard to utter the abominable word Frisco, which has no linguistic or other warrant, shall be deemed guilty of a high misdemeanor and pay the Imperial Treasury as penalty the sum of $25. You have all been sufficiently warned. In 1863, I took up residence at the Eureka Lodgings at 642 Commercial Street, now 624, between Montgomery and Kearney, where I lived for the next 17 years, always paying my rent of 50 cents a day in cash. It was there that I was recorded in the 1870 census with my occupation listed as emperor. And in the column explaining why I was not eligible to vote, the census taker chose the option of insane. My days followed a regular pattern. Every morning I dressed in my uniform, paid my rent, and read the newspapers. I then walked a block and a half to Portsmouth Square where I would sit on the park benches with the old 49ers. I was a people's emperor and was known to be perfectly rational, approachable, and could speak eloquently on a wide range of topics except one. If you questioned my authority as emperor, there would be trouble. When old St. Mary's church bell signaled noon, I would have lunch at one of the numerous saloons on Montgomery Street, always for free and after lunch would go to the Mechanics Institute Library to play chess or write a proclamation. In 1867, a private police officer named Armand Barbier created a civic uproar by arresting me for being a vagrant. But I had my Eureka Lodgings room key and about $5 in my pocket, so the officer charged me with involuntary treatment of a mental disorder newspaper editorials blasted the police. After reading the newspapers, Police Chief Patrick Crowley immediately released me with his apology. From that day forward, all police officers would salute me when I passed them on the street. I attended the California State Legislature and my input was always warmly received. I believe that prejudice was unacceptable, was known to speak out against bigotry, against the Chinese, African Americans, and Native Americans. I was also an early advocate of the vote for women. Mark Twain knew me well. At one point his office was in a building next to the Eureka Lodgings. He even made me a character in Huckleberry Finn, the King. Not a very flattering portrait, we must say. He would, however, write about me after my death. Robert Louis Stevenson's stepdaughter, Isabel Field, added that to that legend with a book of her own. He was a kindly gentleman, she remembered, in this life I've loved, and fortunately found himself in the friendliest and most sentimental city in the world. The idea being, let him be emperor if he wants to. San Francisco played the game with him. I am a character in numerous works of fiction, including Emperor Norton's Ghost, a Rush of Dreamers, Christopher Moore's Blood-Sucking Fiends, and the graphic novel series, The Sandman. The evening of January 8, 1880, was a cold and rainy night. 
I was walking up California Street toward Knob Hill to attend a regular monthly debate of the Hastings Society at California and DuPont, as Grant Avenue was known in 1880. As I neared Old St. Mary's Church, I staggered a bit, then slumped to the sidewalk and took my final breath, ending my 21-year reign as Norton I, Emperor of the United States, and Protector of Mexico. The next morning, all of San Francisco would wake to the news. The headline of the Chronicle read, Le Roi est mort. The king is dead. Indeed, obituaries ran for me nationwide. In the gold rush days, Joseph Eastland and I were char charter members of Occidental Lodge Number 22 of the Freemasons. Eastland was now president of the Elite Pacific Club and an executive in a gas company that one day would be known as PG&E. It is said that Eastland, Sir William Lane Booker, and other Freemasons continued to pay my dues throughout my reign. Eastland could not envision me buried in a pauper's grave. He raised the money necessary from his club and fellow Freemasons for a funeral fit for an emperor in the Masonic Cemetery. Dressed in a black robe with white shirt and black tie, was placed in a redwood casket festooned with silver. My funeral cortege was over two miles long. Some 30,000 people followed my body from the morgue to the cemetery, some say 200,000. As my casket was lowered into the ground, the world grew dark from a total eclipse of the sun. By 1934, San Francisco removed all of its cemeteries to make more space for the living. I was reinterred on June 30th, 1934 with full civic and military honors at Woodlawn Memorial Park in Colma. The fraternal organization called E. Clampus Vitus, E. Clampus Vitus, pardon me, brothers, uh, commemorate my death every year in January. And we're going to do a whole show about them at some point, believe me. And the Imperial Court of San Francisco celebrates my birthday there every year. In fact, the founder of the Imperial Court, Jose Saria, the widow Norton, is buried in front of me. And we should do a whole program about him and the Imperial Court at some point as well. There are chapters of the Clampers throughout California, Nevada, and other Western states. They are either a historical drinking society or a drinking historical society. So that ends my tale, or does it? In addition to doing this vlog, for the last almost 10 years, we have been doing walking tours of San Francisco. We have to do something since we've returned. They are relaunching April 17, every Saturday at 11. If you would like more information, if you'd like to come attend a tour, EmperorNortonTour.com. It's a blast. Come along. Can't wait to start doing it again. We have missed it immensely. A little further reading. Two biographies which are excellent. Emperor Norton, Mad Monarch of America by Alan Stanley Lane is very good. If you can find this with the original dust jacket, it's a beautiful portrait. But really the definitive work of our life is Norton I, Emperor of the United States by William Drury. The book is hard to find. Both these books are out of print. But uh, this particular book is available as a scanned OCR without corrections and we shall put the link for that in the uh, description of today's episode. It's well worth reading. There are numerous other websites and podcasts, video casts, vlogs, all sorts of thing out there, things out there. Dig deep, but beware. Some do have incorrect information, uh, things like that. So uh, just be aware of that. So until we see you again, stay safe and stay healthy. Be kind to one another until we see you again. A gracious good day.